This episode is sponsored by Statistics, the only mathematics that's virtually useless to the individual. Whoa, whoa, what are they doing? That's my privacy hedge. Hi, go hi. Oh. Oh, aren't relationships just so fun? You get all the joy of sharing your humor, interests, and occasionally genitals with someone or someones whom you share a deep connection with, a history built off of perhaps one of the most complex and delicately balanced social structures in the world. And once you get into a marriage, you can have a couple dozen kids and get ready to be settled into the life that you're pretty much going to have until you die. Then you will either find yourself easing into a soothing rhythm of living in a suburban dream, or develop a severe case of boredom and feel a need to expand your horizons. And this is where we run into Peggy Hill, who, despite her Katamari-sized ego and inflated sense of self-importance, I would still consider to be a fairly smart and insightful person. When she is actually able to detach her sense of self from an issue and look at it more objectively, she often offers some pretty good advice or cutting insights. They're taking out that yield sign by the Ethan Allen. Lives will be lost. I mean, let's just list off a few of her achievements. She helped the guys come up with the Mr. Big plan to help Dale. She helped Cotton earn his war hero's grave. She tutored David Kaleiki Alai a lot, even though they said he was unteachable. And she even saved Christmas. Peggy is a thinker, one with admitted lapse in common sense and a lack of practical knowledge. But she is very cultured and even occasionally artistic. What? I ain't got no learning. Hank, on the other hand, is much more like Mike Ehrmantraut from uh, Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad in that he is Mr. Practical. He is the guy who knows how to fix just about everything and is super knowledgeable about his particular niches, but has a disturbing lack of awareness about certain cultural or social projects. Do I look like I know what a JPEG is? I just want a picture of a god dang hot dog. Let me put it this way. If you went to your DVD collection, or I guess streaming service library, or dare I even say the pirated movie files on your computer, ugh, uh, <laughs> How many of your favorite movies do you think that Hank would actually be willing to watch with you? And of those movies that he'd be willing to watch, how badly do you think he would just sit there and pick them apart? Remember how he treated that crummy little magic show at Abracapasta? Explaining how all the magic tricks worked with a scoff and an eye roll. Oh, how silly, how droll. Hollywood's not gonna want to make a picture about an adulterer. I would much, much rather watch a movie with Peggy, if only just to hear her totally unhinged but very invested thoughts. Oh no! My opinion! <laughs> So yeah, we're never going to get more than three words out of Hank about Eraserhead, which means that there is a whole swath of Peggy's world that he is totally detached from. Why do we have to watch a foreign movie? If it was any good, they would have made an American version. All right, that's it, Peggy. I'm going to have to ask you to relinquish the remote control. And while I do think it is very important for people in a relationship to have different interests away from their partner, this isn't just about preferring a different TV show or a book series or whatever. This is an entire school of thought that Hank cannot or will not engage with. With all of that being said, I now want to discuss the season two episode, The Arrowhead, in which Peggy meets someone who is very much in that cerebral sphere. This is a guy who has put all of his stat investment into intellect, neglecting things like strength, charisma, and morality. Through our discussion of this episode, we'll be examining just how close, if at all, Peggy was to cheating on her himbo husband. Okay, okay, maybe Hank isn't a true himbo, but he's sort of in that atmosphere, you know? Let's call him a dad bow. A skilled fellow with a dad bod that is otherwise kind of attractive in that sort of like, Jag is a rerun tonight, eh, eh, kind of way. But anyway, let's put on our detective hats and take a peek at the episode and see whether or not Peggy was tempted to cheat uh, on her husband. That's exactly right. The episode begins with Hank showing off his fancy new John Deere rototiller, which captures the awe of the neighborhood, especially Dale. 13 inch super lug tires, and if I'm not mistaken, this model comes with a hat. Can I have it? Oh, look at how generous Hank is being to his best friend. Oh, you love to see it, it warms my heart. Ah, besides, who wouldn't want a free hat? Meanwhile, Peggy has Bobby sat down for educational TV time, explaining to him the joys of British humor. That man is wearing a dress. Exactly. 
It's thanks to viewers like her that PBS can afford to run programs like Ghost Watch. And it's thanks to viewers like you, yes, yes, that's right, you right there, that I can afford to keep on reviewing this wonderful TV program. So thank you very much. While trying out his new tiller, a very special artifact gets jammed up its gears, once again reminding me of the horrible nightmare that is Stephen King's The Mangler. <laughs> But even worse than that, Peggy reveals that Hank's rock is in fact an arrowhead and describes it like this. This is an arrowhead. I led a field trip once to the Museum of Texas Cultures. A little girl swallowed one just like this by mistake. She thought it was a rock too. As visions of lacerated throats dance behind my eyeballs, <laughs> uh, Hank goes out looking for more artifacts and finds this neat little tool. What's it for? You jam one of these in the back of a white man's skull Twist the handle like so, and then your blood runs out through the hole here. Beyond this being an extremely amusing bit of glibness from Hank, I have to give some appreciation for the shadowing being done here. Season 2 is where the animators really started to settle into the King of the Hill art style and decided to deepen their craft by adding extra bits of lighting like this. It's a great touch and really adds a nice bit of mood to this scene. And speaking of moods, Hank does not want to use the tool improperly, so he decides to go to the tool master himself. Uh, sorry, Shug. Dale's at work. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm looking for, uh, John Redcorn. Talk about knowing someone's work schedule, am I right? Sheesh. After 13 years, those two are still going at it morning, noon, and night. I'm impressed, honestly. John goes on to tell Hank that the tool is used for straightening the shaft of arrows, which I think is what he was just doing with Nancy, and Hank gives us this little piece of gold. In a pinch, though, you could jam it into someone's brain stem, right? Yes, but that's true of almost any tool. And you know, even though John Redcorn starts to lecture Hank about not taking what belongs to others, he at least has the good grace to blush when the irony of the situation becomes apparent. I feel like in later seasons, John Redcorn just gets a little too comfortable with his relationship with Nancy. Here, he's still very much in the, ooh, I shouldn't be doing this, but I just can't help myself, in for a penny, in for a penis, I guess, you know? Anyway, Hank goes to Arlen University to investigate the value of the artifact, but what I find super interesting here is that Arlen is apparently a big enough town to have their own college campus, and one that looks pretty decent, honestly. They even have petitioners going around asking for the legalization of hemp, and a hyper-focused class of only eight students. And say what you will about Professor Lerner, but I'd be willing to bet that his students are getting an extremely dedicated education. I would honestly kill for a cohort this size. It's perfect, perfect, I tell you. And speaking of perfect... That's right, they're breasts. Big deal. Okay, look, yes, okay, she's being a bit abrasive here, sure, but Hank did tilt his head all the way down to read her shirt, so I'll give her some credit. Having, like, rockin' tits like that must get exhausting, so no thank you. I would be a little testy, too, if I were in her bra strap. Ugh. From here, we get introduced to Professor Lerner, who is voiced by Maurice LaMarche, who's voiced such notable figures as Big Bob Pataki from Hey Arnold, The Brain from Pinky and the Brain, and a few notables from Futurama, such as Kiff, Calculon, and everyone's favorite anchor monster, Morbo. But really, he's one of those voice actors who does a lot of background or minor characters. He's the sawdust that fills out the hot dog, you know? And as Professor Lerner, he continues the role of being an invaluable additive to the pig's anus by being a total douche to Hank. Look, I don't want to argue this. I I'll just take the $10. Count it. It's all there. <laughs> uh, okay. On top of negging Hank like a Sigma male to any woman with a pulse, Professor Wormer fishes out the arrowhead and begins to put a larger plot into motion. Ooh, building tension. Love to see it. Back at home, Peggy chastises Hank for selling off the arrowhead instead of using it to help Bobby with his school projects, and we get yet another horrible, horrible visual aid to torment my restless nights. What are you so upset about? I got $10 for some junk that Bobby would have just ended up swallowing. Ugh. What's with this episode and trying to make me picture kids swallowing arrowheads? God, that's just so awful. <laughs> 
Thankfully, the next morning we get something slightly more edible than a killing tool in the form of fried chicken. Bobby and Luann are going ham on that bird to make a replica Tenkawa necklace for Bobby's school project, and I think Bobby may have been spending a little bit too much time with Peggy lately. I was gonna bring in the arrowhead and get an A and maybe even go to college, but Mom says you sold out my future for $10. I hope you're happy. Now, I think it's actually really smart that the writers decide to use Bobby as the driving force for Peggy's initial interactions with the professor. She is taking this sort of like weirdly proactive role in Bobby's education and, as we're about to see, she isn't about to let a PhD dig up her yard for absolutely nothing, so I gotta give her credit there. In a way, I actually think it was really smart of Peggy to leverage this situation in order to get some free lectures in for Bobby. You see, kids, education isn't just for the social elites or seniors moments away from death. It can be something for you, too. And what do you know, using all of these big words have made the higher education goons come a-knockin' on the hill's doorstep. The professor, who introduces himself as both a doctor and a PhD, lays out how they may be able to find more artifacts in the hill's yard, and Sweet talks Peggy into getting her to sign his little release form. And most of all, I want you to thank yourself. Oh, no, I couldn't. For advancing the cause of knowledge, Peggy? Come on now, I want to hear it. Well, thank you, Peggy Hill. You are welcome. And this is just yet another reason of why I cannot find it in me to hate Peggy. Her desire for intellectual or cultural validation completely blinds her to this guy's BS, which he is fully aware of and takes advantage of. This is much less of a, yes, finally, someone's gonna make me feel like the smartest woman in the world, and much more of a, oh, thank God, someone actually appreciates all the boring PBS specials I've sat through. Thank goodness, please talk to me. I wanna have a conversation, God. And the professor recognizes this need and takes advantage of it, meaning basically that anything he finds in her yard is his property. So what the fuck? He's clearly like the worst guy ever here. He's taking advantage of somebody who just wants some recognition. Dare I even say a friend. My God. In his own words, he, quote, probably could have gotten the title to her house if he complimented her stupid glasses, which gotta say, are words that I don't think should be uttered by someone wearing a perfectly round pair of testicle spectacles, just saying there, fella. So, as to be expected, things quickly go downhill, with the professor immediately taking the initiative and, well, doing this to Hank's lawn. No! <laughs> Me think someone on the writer's team likes seeing Hank's lawn suffer. The professor's crew gut that thing like a pumpkin, and while we stand in awe of this sod massacre, we get this haunting bit of insight from Bill. I never thought I'd see the day when my own government would go around stealing people's land. Isn't that what happened to the peoples who lived here before us? Sadly, Boomhauer tells Hank that he is caught in a legal bind and cannot do anything to stop this autopsy of his grassy knoll. But what makes this situation even worse is that the professor's team are actually finding more artifacts, which I'm certain have intense value, both from a financial and cultural standpoint. No joke, if Peggy hadn't been tricked into signing away the rights to all of these goodies, this could have been quite the windfall for the Hill family. But no, now the artifacts are just going to sit there in the Arlen University as learning tools or possibly even return to the descendants of the local tribes. Ugh. It just makes my inner capitalist want to vomit out its diamond encrusted bones. Sheesh. While my splank Nick Gangly is being tickled, we get to see that the professor is worming his way ever deeper into Peggy's good graces. She listens with rapt attention to his stories, his lectures, and even finds herself being a little charmed by his knowledge of larger cultural points. A Wahasha bracelet is not jewelry. It's a badge of honor. A young brave would give one of these to a girl he liked as a symbol of their bond. Wahasha means connection, but it can also mean much more. After this, Peggy brings a class on a field trip to the dig site, and we get to see a bit of the professor's humor, which honestly seems to line right up with Peggy's preference for darker jokes. If a bony hand reaches out from the soil and tries to drag you into its grave, remain calm. <laughs> Seriously, remain calm. If he wasn't such a douche-flavored popsicle, I think I might actually like this guy. But he's so steeped in awfulness that I can't appreciate the slight chunks of goodness that I find. 
He pretty much only exists to make Hank's life a living hell, to make him worry at every turn that something, hey, may be up. And just to give these anxieties a solid form, we see that Peggy is, gasp, wearing the professor's bracelet, and she takes this rather haughty tone when it comes to warning the professor about the upcoming rain. Now, if you'll excuse me, I really should go warn him. His sob has leather seats. This is where Hank finds himself in a horrible position, as he is clearly losing Peggy's affection, and it is even clear to Dale, of all people, who says that every man will occasionally worry about his wife cheating on him. My Nancy's going to Corpus Christi this weekend for some migraine workshop. I'm suspicious as hell. See, Dale isn't entirely unaware that Nancy may cheat on him. He's just too trusting of a friend that he's known for over a decade. You have to remember, John Redcorn has been a part of Dale's life for a long time. In a weird way, it would be somewhat illogical to think that such an affair could stay going for 13 years. Cheating is usually a spur-of-the-moment decision, or something that fizzles out once the thrill is over, or those who are cheating decide to move on and cheat with somebody else. They're free, they can be with anybody they want. But somehow, Nancy has basically found husband number two in John Redcorn, which is really unusual. As for Dale's advice to Hank, I don't agree with this school of thought, because it's really based on the idea of like, oh, if you don't watch your partner, they'll cheat on you the first chance they get. But, I will admit, I do think there is some truth in being afraid that you aren't holding your partner's attention because there may, uh-oh, be something wrong with you. Maybe you are not holding their attention, and therefore they will go and seek out that sort of attention that they want from somebody else. This may cause you to think, oh, am I good enough? Are we just going through the motions here? What would happen if someone better came along? Am I holding them back? These kind of self-deprecating thoughts can become something of a self-fulfilling prophecy where you become so convinced that there is nothing desirable about you that you begin to sink into a depression or a defeatist mindset that ends up hurting the relationship. Instead of letting this nightmare settle into a certainty, Hank decides to take a more proactive approach, one that, for some reason, draws in Bill to his garage later at night what are you making i'm making a problem go away uh-huh what you got possums what an utterly strange appearance here does just bill wander in like this a lot i mean it is bill so i wouldn't be surprised but this is perhaps the first instance of the bill we get where he's like weirdly omnipresent in or around the hill house he's just sort of everywhere it's really kind of creepy but also like i don't know it's it, uh, bill's there my goodness don't turn on the porch light he might be out there <laughs> remember when he was rooting around in their garbage my god Anyway, Bill aside, can we just appreciate how utterly dark Hank is in the silhouette? The man looks like he's a static shock villain, for goodness sake. Look at that. <laughs> Unfortunately, the next day, Hank's plan to humiliate the professor with a fake necklace totally backfires, with poor Peggy finding the necklace, putting forward a few of her own tentative theories, and getting completely decimated by the professor and his gaggle of undergraduate goons. They make it look so easy, don't they? You know the secret? They're archaeologists. What? Well, I don't understand. Oh, I get it. Archaeologists, right? Archaeologists. God, that hurts so bad. Poor Peggy and her little cute archaeologist outfit, too. Ugh, this is where Hank's jealousy finally comes out. Peggy begins to cry, and I am rendered speechless by how horrible that fence background looks. Yikes! In the end, Hank confesses that he was, in fact, Jelly, that he does love Peggy, and even tops off this little moment by kicking some dirt in her face. Peggy then sheds her bracelet and rejoins her husband on stable ground. This adorable moment is then immediately ruined by the professor. Sounds like I could have scored with your wife for the price of a fake bracelet. What? And his punishment is the most severe, the most Mike Judge thing ever, with all of the members of the Hill family pushing him into that hole. You know what's ironic about this? You're the one who looks stupid right now. Okay? So you're stronger than I am. You've proven that. Fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I think he needs to get a refund on whatever degrees he may have gotten, because they were not enough to teach him to try getting out at a different spot of the yard so they don't keep pushing in the hole, you idiot! Come on! Even Bobby gets a chance to shove him in, which is the kind of delightfully immature retort that this situation really deserves. The solution isn't overly violent, I mean, this is still a PG-14 kind of show, but there is just this little bit of physical comeuppance that is immensely satisfying. 
We don't need to see him fired from his job or rendered penniless or whatever. Just humiliating him in front of his students who do nothing to help him is enough of an ending. I'm starting to enjoy this. I really am. I want you to push me in the hole. Please, push me in the hole. Okay. <laughs> So that's the episode, but now is the time to address the clickbait title of this video, which is, Was Lady Margaret Tempted to Cheat on Lord Rutherford with that scoundrel Professor Bone Fondler? In my opinion, no. There is a big difference between being a little taken aback by someone's flirting, as Peggy clearly was, and buying a ticket to the Humpback Whale Aquarium. If anything, this is a case where the Peggy haters have the correct explanation. She was simply wearing his bracelet and hanging out with him because he was feeding her desire for validation, or if you want to be a little reductive here, feeding her ego. The only time she was actually tempted to go down the devil's slip and slide was with Monsignor Martinez, who is much more handsome and has way more of a celebrity status than this dorky little professor ever could. Put simply, the professor's only strength was in his smarts, which is clearly something Peggy doesn't put first in her relationships. You know, I was gonna say, uh, I think Peggy would hate being in a relationship with someone who's smarter than her, but really, who would want to be in a relationship with someone who is constantly reminding you that, hey, actually, you're not as smart as them, especially if they have the degrees to back those statements up? Personally, I think that while education can certainly make you knowledgeable about a particular subject or show your willingness to study, having a degree does not automatically make you the smartest person in the room. And you can believe me when I say this, because after all, I do have a dual concentration master's in English. <laughs> snarf, snarf. <laughs> Yeah, trust me, nobody likes people with that attitude. Ugh. And that's the archaeology episode, everybody. So what are some of my final thoughts about it? Well, even though I don't think Peggy was tempted to cheat, I am very glad that we only get to see this story from Hank's perspective. It keeps Peggy's mindset hidden from us, which then makes us understand why Hank would be feeling anxious about the situation. I think it was actually a really smart decision, as it keeps the tension high throughout the episode, and we are treated to this like nice push and pull of worry, where sometimes it feels like Hank is being too paranoid, but then other times it's like, oh my gosh, he has every reason to be concerned, he's just right on the money. And best of all, through some kind of crazy magic, I don't actually think Peggy comes out of this feeling like an awful person, and how did they do it? Well, it's because her need to educate Bobby is the perfect explanation for why she's getting so close to the professor, she isn't flirting back and she's mostly acting out of like admiration or awe for his intellect rather than desire which means that there's clearly nothing going on there upon like a rewatch like oh she's just like really impressed by this guy which keeps things feeling really clean and as for professor wernstrom well he is firmly the worst antagonist we've gotten since twig boy in the pilot he isn't really a funny character at all and he is clearly a threat to the hill family as a unit in fact, this is almost a sister episode to the pilot, narratively speaking, with Hank having to once again overcome his discomfort with showing emotion and make it clear to another member of his family how he feels. I wouldn't consider this an overly funny episode, but, you know, not all of them have to be. Sometimes it's fine just to get us involved in a little bit of family drama. But hey, I think we've had our fill of subtlety and inner character turmoil for a while. How about we get into something with a little bit more bite to it, a little bit more bombastic? How about we dive into the terrifying mind of a Christian fascist? How about we examine the wonderful and terrifying Junie Harper? She's a new member of our church who has made herself known in a very short time through a series of gutsy letters, complaints, and threats. Miss Junie Harper. You know, in a past episode, I said that I could fix Miss Kettleman from Better Call Saul, but I admit, hands up here, I cannot fix Miss Junie Harper. <laughs> she just says, like, sex kills, and you know what? If it's with her, I can almost believe it, because she exudes big praying mantis energy. You feel me? I'm not sure. Satan be gone! Now you see? Yes. But either way, that baddie is for next time. For now, we can say that this episode, titled The Arrowhead, has indeed been reviewed to death. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode. After referred to as Dango Life from Ancient Antiquities, pursuant to the public domain Title IX, said with such state resource code, but I'll tell you what, man, it's airtight. Boomhauer, I didn't understand a word you just said. Damn legalese.